Okay, I think we're going to start it. It looks like this is our group path for coming. We've got some new folks and returning folks, and we're we're down a little bit. I guess it scares people a lot <laughs> with all the emotional talk. They're like, I'm not coming back to that guy. It felt a little bit like therapy. <laughs> there is some week two handouts back there, along with the grief ball of emotions, if you didn't get them. Um, so we're halfway through my time with you, okay? Um, think for a minute about some of the stuff that I've talked about, and some of the stuff that you guys have shared. What do you, what do you learn? as you sit here. to his kids, his, he's got two four years old, and, and I just have been wary of talking to the grandkids. I just, oh. I, my emotions are so deep that yeah. I, I don't want to bring out, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't know anyone. So yeah. that's, that's one of the issues with the, you know, I think that the support, I want to be there to support them, but yet, I'm scared too. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah, so we talked about give every emotion the time and space it needs, and yet, you want to be able to talk. Right. You know, you want to be able to share, and that's difficult sometimes. Yeah. I think I'm going to shut this. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we get some traffic. Mm -hmm. Well, what we've done in week one, we talked about just the importance of grief from scripture, the importance of grief from psychology, and I pulled from the grief share books which I brought with me today, I thought I'd pass them around. The three ends of grief, that grief is normal, grief is natural, and grief is necessary. Mm -hmm. So we kind of started with that. And then we talked about myths of grief, you know, that um, there's stages, not necessarily, that everybody's grief needs to be different. Uh, people shouldn't tell you how to grieve. Um, your goal is not to get over your grief, your goal is to get through it and to reconcile with it, a couple things like that. Then last week, we dealt into uh, a lot of emotional awareness, um, the importance of emotion and how when emotions come, there's like this current and there's lots of different emotions in there. And sometimes when you pay attention to one emotion and you give it space, it moves to a different emotion. So when people come to me and they're stuck in anger, I slowly kind of move them to sadness, okay? Or if they're stuck in sadness, I might look for anger and they need that. So <coughs> things like that. And just being willing to do that movement. We talked about layers of emotion, that sometimes underneath anger is hurt, loss, and fear. Those are more primary emotions. They're more difficult to express because they feel more vulnerable. So we talked about that. And then we talked a little bit about who taught you how to feel. You know, what was your family of origin like? In my family of origin, there was hardly any anger. You know, so I, I didn't think I ever got angry. And I talked about that. And um, because that's where you get your first ideas about different emotions. And then we talked about the Psalms of Lament and how there's almost twice as many psalms of lament as psalms of praise. Thank God for that, because we can cry out to God. And I told you I've had a client that wrote his own psalm of lament. It was just beautiful as a way of helping him through grief. And Jesus' example, Jesus in grief. Of course, we know Isaiah said he's a man of sorrows, a boy who was in grief, and he took on our sufferings. And then I handed this out on yellow paper, and I said, sometimes it's like this. It's this just tied up ball, and there's some extra back there, and 
sometimes it's just really hard to feel anything. And I encourage you to take one feeling, maybe look it up, write a time that you felt it, and then tell somebody who you're close to. And that way you take one of these threads and you just kind of unravel it and take care of some of that junk that's all tied up in your stomach. So I'm sure you all did that. Good job. <laughs> Any other comments now that I've reminded you what you what you're learning? I don't know that I don't know where this fits in, but I've always felt like you know, we talked the first week about how our culture is American culture is so bad at allowing grief, knowing what grief is. And I think a little bit of the problem is is just death. Mm. When, you know, you mentioned the first thing you said that first week, you know, you go through a day, you may have half a dozen things that you have to read that day. Yeah. And it may be nothing more than I was late for a meeting or I wrecked a car or I, <laughs> you know, and therefore we're, we're running out of gas and I had to walk to church. Oh, 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 You know, we don't practice grief on the small things. No. no and then right. we have no clue what to do with the big things. A lot of losses, you know, um, that just happen to us all the time that take space, you know, and just recognizing those. We're going to talk today, too, about secondary grief, which is really important. Um, things that are now different because of my primary grief. You know, we're going to talk about that, and that's that's going to be important too. And I think a lot of times that compounds, like you don't even realize it as you're going throughout the day. I mean, if you don't address it, then you end up just unless hey, it is just me. I end up a volatile mess, and at home, whenever it's just Jason and I, I'm like doing the dishes and slamming the cabinets and upset about 74 things that compounded that I just done right there. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, do you want him to say, "Hey, honey, what's up"? I want him to hold me. Okay. So I can just cry. That's great. Out. Does he know that? He has held me. It was especially That's good. because my father passed away just before Christmas. I it was a very hard oh, time hi. with all the traditions and yeah. there for a while I just pretend to be happy and right. fake it through for my family. Or under the, the main say of I'm doing this for my kids, we're carrying on traditions and this is the way it needs to be and that I never addressed any of those things within myself and Christmas came and I was like, I cannot do a single minute more and the tree needs to come down and everything needs to happen now because I can't. It's got to stop. Right now it's got to yeah. stop. So okay. it was a very unhealthy way. That's a great yeah. example. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, this stuff has an accumulating effect. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but when, when <clears throat> mom had because of the way the school system deals with how many days you get, it's so crazy. You're only allotted this many days, for certain, and it's got to be in sequence. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't go over the weekend, which made it, it was not the way I would have liked to have had yeah. at yeah. all. But the school system, and I don't know if any other employers are like that, but. You know, you, you just, you have to follow their rules. It's got to be this way, and you can't go over the weekend. Yeah. I'm going, really? Yeah, and that, that brings up one of the things I mentioned briefly is attachment and grief. The stronger the attachment you have to the mm -hmm. grief object, mm -hmm. the more difficult and complicated the grief is. Um, and, you know, with mom or dad, you know, that's, that's big. I'm going to pass these around. This is grief share. Um, and there's four different books, A Time to Grieve, Experiencing Grief, Finding Hope and Healing, and Building and Remembering. And it kind of takes you through some of what we've been talking about. So if you want to just take a peek at them and pass them around, we're not going to get it around to everybody, but you can jot that down. And then this is the same guy, Kenneth Hawk, who's really good, the same guy that does that. Don't sing songs to a heavy heart. We've talked about that. You know how important that is. Be <coughs> one with those that mourn. You know. So, and I talked to you about the training that I got from John Townsend. These are two other Townsend quotes when we dealt with grief. 
Uh, one of the things he said is grief is never fully experienced till it's experienced in the presence of another caring person. And then these are some other things that John taught us. Grief is painful work that heals most other painful work. What we're discovering is with people that come with anxiety and depression, there's often grief work at the bottom of that. And if they didn't do the grief work, they're going to continue to have other kind of mental health issues. And that's what he meant by that. And then grief alone doubles the time grief and community cuts it in half. And that's what we're doing. I mean, that's what we're doing right here. We're with each other talking about these things. Um, and that's, that's really helpful as we move through this stuff together. So we're going to focus in on mourning today. Yay, mourning. <laughs> Are you ready? Morning to joy. I want to start out teaching you some deep breathing. A lot of times when we breathe, it's kind of shallow. It's from here and we breathe like this. That's not a good breath. Your, your body's not getting the oxygen blood that it needs. Everything should be from down here. So when we breathe in, it should be like blowing up a balloon. Then you should hold it for a couple seconds and then breathe out. And we know now from polyvagal studies, from the vagus nerve, which is the primary nerve that impacts our system, our nervous system, that extending the exhale even calms you even more. So I do a thing where I breathe in two, three, four, hold two, three, four, out two, three, four, five, six. Get that in your head. And let's try that from here down, okay? When you breathe in, you're pushing out your stomach. You're not doing any of this, okay? So it's gonna go like this. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six. Again, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six. That's a good, now what that does, it calms the emotional brain, which is called the amygdala, and allows the frontal cortex to engage, which is your executive functioning part, okay? So when you're angry, anxious, any of that, deep breathing will cool that part and will allow you to think, hmm, what do I wanna do with these feelings, or what do I need to do right now? So I do this a couple times a day, and I often combine it with scripture. <laughs> so one of the things I do in, in, my, in my therapy work is, if I've just sat with somebody, and they've had a ton of anger or shame or something like that, I'll spend a couple minutes and I'll breathe out what I just took in. God, I breathe out anger and shame. I breathe in your peace. God, I breathe out whatever I just, remember I talked about attunement? That when you're so connected to the person, your neurons are firing the same as theirs, and you're actually experiencing what they are. That's that amazing way that God made us. So I breathe that out. Or sometimes, when I want to feel closer to God, I'll call him my Abba. And sometimes I'll just breathe, Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I love you. When I'm really overwhelmed, I just do those kinds. Great way to just settle yourself down when you're feeling overwhelmed. So, no extra charge <laughs> for that, okay? All included in your experience. Okay. So, let's look at this. Um, remember, grief and loss is what you experience. Mourning is how you decide to process it. And as Doug pointed out, mourning is not really valued. There are other cultures, like in Judaism, with the Shiva where they specifically go for, I believe, seven days and move through all these different things. Um, really important. So Dr. Alan Wolfelt, you might have heard of him. He comes to Fort Wayne normally once a year. Uh, one of the funeral homes in Fort Wayne brings him in. He's amazing. I've read his stuff and I've heard him speak. Um, he's kind of one of the experts uh, recognized in grief work. Um, and so this is some of his stuff, which I've adapted. Um, 
So you think about with grief, a lot is taken from you. He has rewritten this as, here's your right. <laughs> These are the rights you have as somebody who's mourning. And I kind of like that. It's more of a positive thing. Um, obviously, we've talked about your own unique experiences. Everybody's grief is different. Mm -hmm. You don't have to respond to somebody, oh, you never cried, or you never got upset, or how come you're still posting things on Facebook five years later? You know, that, that's different people process grief differently, and you don't, you have the right to not accept that, and just try to stick with what, what you're doing to reconcile with grief. Different emotions, we've talked about that. We said get rid of the Kubler-Ross stages. They were specifically for people facing death. They weren't for grief. And there probably isn't, there may be stages, but they're not in any particular order, and you also may go back. It's like, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm angry again. I thought I dealt with that. Well, you did. <laughs> and now you need to create some more space for it. OK, you have the right to talk. That's going to vary. Um, I'm a good, strong extrovert, as you might imagine. My wife is not. She's a very strong introvert. So I feel like she needs to talk about things. <laughs> And she doesn't. She just needs her designer blogs and her Hallmark channel, and she's fine. <laughs> so you relate to that? I remember when I first started teaching online, which I do not prefer, um, I would get these online students, and they'd write these beautiful posts, just so good. And then I'd get online, I'd, get on, I'd do a face-to-face -face with them on Zoom, and I'd say, Sharon, you man, what you wrote about that was so good. Would you talk about it? And they look at me like, I wrote it. Why would I want to talk about it? And that was the, how they process things. So I'm still learning after 47 years of marriage that what it's like to live with an introvert. She sends me stuff all the time. Read this, read this, you'll understand me. <laughs> um, somehow it's not sticking. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm hopeless. Don't you just feel like the world would be better if people were more like you? Come on, I'm really yeah. happy. Be like me. You know? Oh, that was bad. That was the original sin. <laughs> I know that that, that intro, I just introverts just have a different way, you know, of, of processing information. Um, there is some value in talking out loud about things if you find safe people that are not going to judge or fix, you know. But that's hard sometimes too. <coughs> yeah, the, all the social media stuff is literally changing our brain. Mm -hmm. If you want to read an interesting book on that, it's called The Shallows. The Shallows is a book that's looking at how our brains are changing because of all the texting and social media and lack of connection. Uh, we're becoming excellent skimmers and scanners and no longer know how to reflect and meditate and things like that, which are super important for Christians as well. Okay, number four. You have the right to accept limitations, physically, emotionally, uh, you guys know grief takes a lot from you. It really does. And there's times you just feel numb. Or you think, I, I don't know why, but I just feel heavy today, and I don't have any energy. Yeah. And maybe that corresponds to something you saw and it didn't click. Or maybe it's close to an anniversary of something. You know? Um, but you, remember, I said, uh, approach all those changes curiosity and compassion, not with judgment. Because there's just a lot of things going on that you might not understand. And you gotta be able to accept those too. Um, number five, honor the memories. Really important to remember. And I know that remembering brings strong emotion, mm -hmm. but that's part of the healing process. 
there's important positive memories that you have, or maybe there's some anger memories that you have, it's okay to think and feel about them. Uh, don't try to block them. If you block a memory, you're blocking an emotion, most likely. Um, and again, try to be around safe people where you can talk about that. I was just thinking, Veterans Day, so my father-in-law was a World War II combat vet. An amazing man. Taught me so much about how to love my wife and how to love Jesus. He was just incredible. And um, he was at the Heritage. And I know my wife and I go to Fort Wayne a lot. And whenever we come back to Fort Wayne, we take that exit mm -hmm. before you get to 9 and yeah. then come around. And still when I drive by 9, I just have kind of a like yes. a heaviness. Mm -hmm. This is five and a half years. I would go see Stuart, yeah. you know, because I love visiting with him. He was so great. <clears throat> and Deborah, I think, got tired of the stories when she heard him for the 12th time. And I would always <laughs> act like I'd never heard him. <laughs> really? Oh. And you did? Wow. That's great. You know, I go. Deborah's like, she's walking away. <laughs> but she heard him her whole life. Okay, grief first. We talked about how grief is sometimes like this ocean wave. It'll just, you think you're fine and then you yeah, just get overwhelmed with something like, what the heck is that? Where did that come from? Um, but you just have the right to just create some space for that. You know, I'm going to stay home today. I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do less because I'm feeling that heaviness. Something just, just hit me. Um, you know, it might be that you want to stay off Facebook at different times, you know, that might trigger things. You know, if you lost a veteran, you might not want to be on Facebook during Veterans Day or Independence Day. Um, just being smart about things like that, but taking time to feel that. Okay, other cultures do rituals, and for us, you know, you can journal, you can speak aloud, you can create some photos, um, you can make something or buy something to help you move through the morning pro pro process. Remember I told you that my grandma's house was really important. There were so many memories there. And I took pictures of different rooms. And then I wrote a little card of what we did in that room as a way to say goodbye to the house. You know, I'm kind of weird. I said goodbye to a car once. <laughs> A car that I drove to Purdue to get my PhD twice a week for five years. I remember sat, sitting in the car and just talking to the car and thanking it for keeping me safe. I cried a little bit. My wife thinks I'm crazy. That's not weird. That's the longest relationship I've had. Cars are important. Some of the new research on attachment theory is saying that pets can do just as much as a human relationship in healing trauma. I was reading a, a study once, I forgot which university did it, but I am childless by mostly by choice, but um, especially for women without children, when they lose a pet, they compared it to what's going on in the brain, all the chemical actions that are going on, they compared a study to losing a child, and they found a lot of similarities. Oh, yeah. So some people are like, oh, it's just a dog. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real helpful comment, right? <laughs> no, it's not just that they're, they're part of the family, and they love you unconditionally. You've seen the shirts, be the person your dog thinks you are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a great shirt. It's true. I work hard so my dog can have a better life. <laughs> there you go. So think about um, if you're a scrapbooker, you know. Um, I've had clients create collages about experiences that they've had to help them move through it. You know, folks that are creative like to do those kind of things. Obviously, you can move toward God. Remember the Psalms of Lament? Remember that David said, How long, O Lord? Four times in the first two verses of that song we talked about last week. Um, and 
and meaning. And meaning comes later. Um, how is your life different? Remember, your brain has to adjust to what you don't have, to what you lost. But maybe new things might come up. You know, we'll talk more about that later. The search for meaning. So there at the bottom, there's some other ideas: reading, listening, creating artwork. Writing letters to the object of your grief. If you if you do write letters, I would encourage you to read them out loud because that's another way to access emotion. Um, you know, angry letters if they left you. Um, you know, letters of sadness. But go ahead and read them out loud. That's the way. And if it's somebody who's still living, you know, you don't have to send it. It's just a way for you to be able to express some of the deeper feelings that you're that you're experiencing. Um, screaming, this is going to sound really crazy. Moaning. Moaning. Get in a room by yourself and just do some good old loud moaning. It's a good release of different emotions. You don't want to be, do it around people. <laughs> but I do a fair share of moaning. Remember last week, I read that passage from my, Cato about Jesus sighed. Mm -hmm. Ah, just the God that sighs. What a great, great idea. So exercise. Here's what we found about exercise. If you're feeling mostly anxiety, resistance exercise is best. Like exercise bands, stretching, lifting, that's best for anxiety. If it's more depression, it's cardiovascular exercise. So running, elliptical, biking, so I do, three times a week, I go to a stretch class at the Y. We stretch for an hour with a group of like 15 people. We have a great time. And then Tuesday, Thursday, I lift, uh, lift weights. So I, I'm getting both of them, okay? So if you can build that into your schedule, that's great. And if, if you're more anxious, do the one. If you're more depressed, do the other. Um, Cardiovascular is just a great antidepressant. Uh -huh. You know, you won't find this in any research because they don't they don't want to compete with meds, but that's that's really effective. Okay, anything coming up so far? <clears throat> Questions? I'm just for me personally, I don't know if this is just the way I process, but praise and worship music too, mm. and that's not on here, but music is therapy for me. And yeah. there are times even at school, I'm anxious over a situation that's happened in the classroom. I go to lunch and I need to decompress and I'm about to cry. You know, like I just need praise and worship music and to just yep, that's great. I mean, it's amazing how God has given other people gifts to write words that I am feeling. And yeah. I'm listening to that and processing and I can be mailing papers and tears coming down my face and I'm ready for the afternoon. <laughs> so. No, that's great. No wonder what you need in the middle of the day. That's fantastic. Really self-aware. Yeah. Like, even like art, any form of art, right? Painting, mm -hmm. crafting, anything like that. Like, oh. I have an artist friend. When I taught at Indiana Wesleyan, he was an amazing man named Rod Crossman. He's now retired. <coughs> but he said, I never feel closer to God than when I'm creating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's we're created in God's image, and He's the amazing Creator. So when we create something, that's when we feel closest to God. I love that. Yeah. Okay, remembering, and we're on the back. Remembering, reconciling. Okay, we've talked about. Don't try to block the memory. Experience them if you can with trusted people. I know that when you remember it. You have to re-experience some of these feelings that you work through. It's like, I thought I dealt with that. No, you did, and now it's back. You know, welcome it and be curious about it and compassionate about it. You'll move through it quicker than if you say, well, it's going on. I can't believe, you know, <laughs> if you judge it and get mad at yourself, that's not going to help you move through it. So that has to do with the feelings that come with remembering and being patient. And go through, go back and do some of the same activities. So we talked a little bit about anniversaries, events that might trigger, remember these to mourn as well. I had a ritual, my dad's funeral was uh, January, actually he was 
buried on Groundhog Day in 2001, which was kind of unique because my dad was a big hunter and he loved shooting groundhogs. <laughs> so he would go, they'd say, Bob, come out, I got a bunch of groundhogs. He had a really shrill whistle, he would whistle and just pop them. <laughs> And the associate pastor got up at the funeral and said, there's a lot of happy groundhogs. <laughs> anyway, I have a cassette tape of his funeral where my brother and I spoke. And I played it every year on Groundhog Day. Um, and I, I kind of wore it out. You know, after 12, 13 years, it kind of, it's kind of worn out. I can't play it. No, 20 years, I can't play it anymore. But that was a ritual. And I sent a note to my brother. I said, listen to Dad's tape again today. And he said, I haven't listened to it yet. Aww. That's how he dealt with stuff. That's OK. <coughs> I, I didn't say you need to do that. But that's what I was doing. That was a ritual. OK, secondary losses. As a result of that person leaving or that person dying, I don't get to do this, or we always did this, or now that changed the relationships, and the, now Thanksgiving was without them. Now financially things have changed. You know, that's, that's hard, and there's a lot of those, and I think there's some value in kind of going through that and saying, yeah, we always did this together, and now we can't. I always counted on him for this, or her for this, and now a secondary loss. And again, if you don't create some space for that, talk about it with trusted people, feel what you're feeling, that could bring up some anger. That could bring up a need to move to forgiveness. Forgiveness is closely tied to grief work. In fact, that's what we're doing next week. So if you don't want to learn about forgiveness, don't do this. <laughs> because um, it's really important to tie forgiveness to grief because of what all you lost and what that person left you with or you know how that person may have hurt you. Also, you have to take out the trash can. Yeah. You have to find somebody to maintain the car because we did that. Yeah. Get the mail in. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's all Lots those of daily things. things that go. And that might be, <laughs> that that might be angry, you know? Like, yeah. Now I got to do that. Yeah. You did it a lot better. I can't do it. Right. It's you know. important to, to reach out. I know some people are like, maybe not ready to reach out, but my niece lost, oh gosh, my niece lost her husband this August, two days before the first wedding anniversary. Oh. And he died of a stroke. They had just planned their anniversary trip, and she went to bed, and then she found him in the kitchen. Um, so her life was just... Yeah. Turned upside down. She has to relocate. She can't afford the house by herself, which is in process, and just all these things. And she, um, and today's her birthday, and I'm not even sure how to like approach it. Because you don't want to be like, oh, happy birthday, because it's it's not a happy Same thinking of you today. Yeah, yeah. Same thing of you today. That's it. That's um, Go ahead. But we went over a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I, um, and her mom was there, and we went over, and we just, they have a huge property, huge, and we just cleaned all the leaves out and cleaned out the gutters and moved her outside furniture in, and um, we were walking around the house to like winterize the house, you know. And I was like, "Oh, do you have something to roll up your your garden house?" She's like, "Can I have flower grass?" And so yeah. she took she took he took care of all the outside, mm -hmm. and I yeah. had just left it, had mm -hmm. not said anything or so. But um, it was important for her to to reach out. You know, she's yeah. like, I'm overwhelmed with these leaves. I can't, you know. That's great. That's a great. That's great what you guys are doing. Because she never had to think about that. No, she always did that. Exactly. She did the interview. You know, there's a lot of stuff you don't need, yeah. you never had to think about. Yeah. You know, you could count on that person. It's no removal. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's hard. It's hard, and it's also good to be able to talk about it. Um, so we talked about the anniversaries. Um, oh, I'm on secondary losses. We talked about that. Number five, accepting those differences. Um, and, and as we reconcile, kind of reorienting to 
gosh, my life is new, like for your niece, so I, can, I can count on my aunt to come and do some of those things. Or I have a neighbor who says, mm -hmm. uh, we have we have a neighbor a couple doors down, and when this person lost their husband, he came over and said, I will mow your lawn mm -hmm. the whole time. Don't ever think about your lawn. What a great gift. Mm -hmm. I see him out there mowing, you know, and I just thank God that he went to her and said that. That was, that was really important. So there could be some positive things. And if we don't create space to handle the negative stuff, we'll never have room for positive that might come up. We know from scripture, look at all these scriptures about <coughs> what we learn. Perseverance, maturity, deep in hope. We learn to accept weaknesses because God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. That second we learn to more deeply comfort others with the comfort that we receive from God. God gives us that opportunity to then reach and comfort others because of what we've been through. So it's only been a couple decades where we've started to learn about post-traumatic growth. You hear a lot about post-traumatic stress. Well, there's research on post-traumatic growth. And what happens is that people grieve well they actually see new growth. And scripture kind of supports that. So there's positive things there too that you can get to um, if you create space for that. Okay, assisting others, which we've talked about a little bit. Listening is the best medicine. Don't try to reassure, don't try to fix. Don't try to share scripture, especially early, that's advice. You know, they're not ready to hear that. They can't create a space for that. Yeah, um, you remember me talking about one of my bosses at Huntington College when I first came, they lost a child and we just went and sat with them and didn't say a word, um, kind of like Job's friends. That's really important. You don't really have to worry about what to say. I mean, I know you, you, you will, but if you just sit in silence and let them lead and just reflect what they say, that's all you need to do because that's going to allow them to process things out loud. Mm -hmm. um, and you might even say, I, I don't know what to say right now, but I'm here. You know, I think, I think I told you the story of when I was teaching Sunday school and a woman was crying in the back row and somebody came over and spoke to her. Did I tell you the story? <coughs> okay. <clears throat> woman was crying in Sunday school and I saw a woman come over and kind of put her arm around her and say something to her and I saw her just immediately didn't want to say anything at the time. I went up later and talked to the person that spoke to her, and I said, I couldn't help imagine, I couldn't help see what, how she changed. What did you say to her? And she said, I just said, I don't know what you're going through. Don't do it alone. I thought, that's fantastic. That's a great thing to say. You know, don't, don't do this alone. Yeah, yeah Cole did that. Six months ago, when my daughter comes in, <coughs> that's awesome. I saw her call in church, and I just sat with her, and I'm like, God told me to, and my husband. <laughs> God told me through my husband to come yeah. over and sit with you, and I just felt the pain. Didn't know each other at all. I didn't, I didn't know my, I didn't know what she was going through. I didn't know her, but I felt her you felt pain. It. Yeah. And she's been my best friend ever since. Oh, that's fantastic. What a, what a great example, too, of how we experience what they're experiencing, which is why people want to share Bible verses and not feel, you know, you know, God's going to work this out for good. You know, everything happens for a reason and all this crazy stuff. Okay, so we we're talking about this, assisting others, listening, letting the other person lead. Um, Move toward whatever thoughts and feelings they're experiencing. Provide a safe place. We talk about safe haven. Um, provide that place for them where they can explore. Reflect and attune as much as you're able. You know, you're going to feel these things too. So if you're experiencing a lot of grief and it's fresh, you might be limited in how much you can do that with somebody else. Um, but you're going to feel those things. The, the neurons are going to be firing. You're going to feel, you know, just like you did when you went over to sit with that person. 
This is something um, reflect in the tune. We've talked about that. This is something that Liz talked about, limiting your self-disclosure. Okay? If you had a similar experience, don't share it early and don't share it long. <laughs> Yeah. Just say, yeah, I remember when my father-in-law died. That was really hard for me. How are you doing? You know, right back to them. Don't stay with this long story about, and we did this, and we did this, and then you might want to do this. No, don't, don't do that. Just get in and get out, you know. <laughs> this sounds crazy, but this reminds me of a watercolor class that I took. When I was on sabbatical at Indiana Wesleyan, I took a watercolor class. It was me and about 17 nuns. <laughs> From Victory Knoll. I was the only guy. And I would look at their paintings and I would say, oh, man, mine does not look like that at all. How do you do that? You know, and my watercolor teacher came over and she said, You're spending way too much time trying to make it. She said, just Get in and get out. Watch this. She did it, and then it ended up beautiful. And I remember thinking, okay, that's how my self-disclosure needs to be. <laughs> get in and get out. Take it, take it right back to them. And ask, I didn't say this on number two, ask open-ended questions. You know? And don't even ask questions, make statements. Open-ended statements are better than questions. So things like, tell me more about that. Or, that sounds really hard. Just things like that is all you need. Little prompts. Um, questions can put people on the defensive, especially if they're closed questions. They feel like, I'm doing something wrong. You know? um, so make it short. And if you have time and capacity, ask, is there anything I can do? But don't do that if you don't feel a strong connection or you don't have time. You know, don't, don't do that. That's, that's not <coughs> okay, that's a lot of stuff on mourning, but I wanted to give you some more specific ideas. What can I do you know, to get through this? And some of it came from the book, some of it came from Townsend, some of it came from my experience. Um, here's a couple questions. Choose one or two of the Bill of Mourning Bill of Rights and talk about how you could begin to implement it. Or if anybody we've been doing this, talking about a memory related to her or Ross, how you can honor that memory and gain strength. Other questions that might come up? At number six, where it says, is there anything I can do to help? Everyone's telling not to ask that question because they don't know. They can't. Oh, early they can't, on, yeah. Yeah, they can't process it. But to do like what you did is just, you saw the need, just to overdo it. You know, that's um, even more helpful than trying to ask because they're probably going to say no. You know, because yeah. I don't know. Yeah, especially early on, they're just mm -hmm. overwhelmed. And especially early on, people yeah. forget like your most basic is eating, mm -hmm. sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So my, my niece received a lot of. Even the food gift cards are not such, they might seem like a good idea, but sometimes the people don't even have the energy or the thought of what you get or going get it. Yeah. So, you get that so just buy the groceries, or pick yeah. some up, and bring it over. Mm -hmm. Those are really helpful things. You know, or even sit, she said, um, in her very first week, a friend just took her out to lunch and made mm -hmm. her eat. Bought her lunch and just sat with her and made great. Yeah. Or if you bring a meal, sit with them, yes. eat with them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to start with. I want to end with a meditation from Psalm 23. Can I see? Yeah, sure can. You know, a lot of these. We just want to say thank you because many of you have been with us. Mm -hmm. My dad did die this week. Yeah. You know, this afternoon. So I mean, most of you all know that. Okay. But, um, it has been. It's been a long week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. And uh, we don't know where we are at home. That's why mom's not here. Okay. Um, 
she needs to rest before this afternoon. Yes. Yeah. But uh, where we are, we don't know yet. Yeah, that's hard. But we thank everybody for what they have done so far. Yeah, and it's really important. Both of those things are true. <coughs> we don't know what the heck we're doing, and thank you for being there. Yeah. Both of those are just. just and and, and in our society, you know. We've been talking about this grief, but we have this has to be done, 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 and, and you really don't. How do you make that happen? Yeah. yeah, how do you make all, like Christy said, how do you make all this stuff happen? Yeah. And when there's conflict here and there, and, and you have to work around this, and you have to work around that, and with multiple people in multiple yeah. countries right. in our family. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Trying to get everybody here and things like that. Not upsetting anybody, right? And, well, you and, know, and you know, we think, oh, the church will take care of us. Well, the church also had multiple things going on yeah. this weekend here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you have to fit into those sequences too. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess one of the best things was a couple hours after you died, I just went out and mowed yard for four, four hours. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just being alone, seeing yourself do something. Focus on that. That's good. Thank you for coming and sharing that. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's been a long road, right? Mm -hmm. For him. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it helps to close your eyes and focus, remember the deep breathing. We'll just end with some comforting <laughs> words here. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He walks beside me in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Being with him just strengthens my soul. He guides me and leads me. Even when I'm walking through darkness and fear, I don't have any fear because he's with me. His rod and his staff sometimes move me and comfort me to keep me on the path. Even if I'm at a table with the presence of my enemies, I'm not afraid. I feel safe. His Holy Spirit anoints me. Goodness and love and mercy are following me all the days of my life until he comes back for me and I dwell in his house forever. Father, thank you that you are the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we receive from you. I thank you for these folks um, and the time that they've spent. I pray that any truth that we talked about would get down deep into their heart and their mind and would move through their feet and their hands and would bring healing and hope. In the name of Jesus, we pray.